Hey guys, welcome to Cast Strength. I'm Vito and that's Josh. And we regret to inform everyone that the Demi Holst Brad will not be joining us tonight. Because why, Josh? Well, Brad is actually in Austin, where I am, but complete other side of town at Wizard Academy for yeah. Melier Level 2 training. So he's quite tied up, having a lot of fun, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, he's doing Level 2 for everybody so that he can give his patented tasting notes. That's real good. That's real good. Yeah, real good. Real good whiskey. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, we are joined by a couple of members of the Whiskey Tribe, if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, uh, I've got uh, two guys that are local here to Austin. we got my friend Jared Gilman here, and we got Jason Phoebe. So uh, if they wanted to come in tonight, uh, Jason actually brought the whiskey that we're drinking right now, the Compass Brox Delilah, uh, special limited edition that they have out right now. And it's, um, it's, it's real good. It's real good. It's real good. So yeah, so it's uh, you three, me and everyone in the chat and uh, everyone listening on playback. Um, for everyone listening on playback, definitely, uh, if you can, check us out live. The, um, the chat's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. yeah, so today's episode is uh, should be a fairly fun one with limited technical issues, but uh, <laughs> we'll remain as professional as always. We got, we got. Um, what do we got? What do we got? We got five. Some, uh, uh, Percent more professional, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna try talking about um, some whiskey journeys, barrel influences, and um, we're gonna get to some Kilimanjaro expressions at the end to review. And uh, if we have some time, we'll do some recommendations. But um, I guess we'll start today be with uh, the three of you because um, you guys did a special tasting a couple of nights ago, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, we did two special tastings, <laughs> one today, uh, earlier today, and one on Monday night uh, from Compass Box. So reason we're having the Delilah here tonight. Uh, Jason here actually wrote a review of, was it No Name? Sorry. Yeah, it was a No Name. Yeah, uh, and Compass Box took notice of his review on Instagram and reached out and said, hey, we're coming to Austin. Uh, we're doing a couple of events. You should come check it out. So uh, Monday night, we went to Seven Grand downtown, which is a uh, an awesome, awesome whiskey bar. Yeah, really, really nice. Um, and what we had, uh, both the Great King Street Expressions, uh, the Artist Blend and the Glasgow Blend, and then a special version of each of those two. One was a seven grand uh, yeah. limited bottling. Another one was for the Houston Bourbon Society, I think. Yes. Yeah, they were both uh, extra, extra matured ones. Right, right. Yeah, they spent a little extra time in some sherry casks, I think is what they said. Uh, and then we had, uh, what else? Story of the Spaniard, the new one that has uh, sherry and Tempranillo uh, wine cask maturation. We had um, Pete Monster. Uh, we had yeah, Pete Monster, Flaming Heart. Flaming, Flaming Heart. Heart. And uh, I feel like I'm missing one. Uh, Spice Tree we had today. They yeah, Spice Tree. didn't have that on Monday. Uh, but anyway, we had a, had a nice spread of, of Compass Box whiskeys yeah. and um, really good time, really informative. They uh, got to give us a little bit behind the scenes information about how they put that stuff together and their special proprietary processes and extra maturation uh, that they do to produce their awesome blends. Uh, and I know you, you've got a little bit of uh, compass box uh, over there, Vito. Um, I don't have anything poured at the moment, but I do have um, this year's a 2018 version of uh, flaming heart and phenomenology, which we discussed a couple of episodes ago. Right. And uh, that was really, really good. I haven't tried the new Flaming Heart, but the 2017 edition was absolutely delicious. Yeah, it's I. I actually have. I'm the reverse. I've only tried the current one. I haven't had the older one. Yeah, from what I remember about the old one, uh, well, the old one, the last year's was that uh, there was a lot more medicinal um, notes out of it because I think they used uh, Lafroy in uh, part of the blending. Which mm -hmm. they didn't in this year, if I'm not mistaken. No, they focused more on the Kalila this year. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, a lot more delicate smoke that you get from the Kalila. 19 year Kalila, they said. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, Compass Box. I mean, I'm sure lots of people that are watching this probably tried it, but uh, started by John Glazier, who used to work for Johnny Walker, and uh, he he'd find these amazing casks of whiskey and and come back talking about the kinds of notes he was getting out of it, and they. They kind of told him, yeah, John, that's cute. Dump it in the vat. <laughs> Let's go. Sure, that can go into Johnny Walker Blue or whatever. And he wanted to put together 
uh, more of a, a craft whiskey brand underneath the Johnny Walker uh, label. Yeah. And keep, keep using Diageo product. And, and um, they, uh, they didn't come around to doing that under Johnny Walker. So he started his own company and uh, wanted to do some interesting, different stuff, break some rules, uh, use some different uh, maturation and marrying processes. So um, yeah, really great creative stuff. I was, I was kind of surprised to find they've only got 15 people in the whole company. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess when you're blending, you don't need too many people involved in, you know, um, the whole distillation process and all that stuff, right? You just need people that know how to blend, know how to taste. Exactly. And I mean, there's three, three of those 15 people are in the U.S. and they're really, you know, marketing reps. And, and Maybe we should uh, do an ad read for Compass Box and maybe they'll hire us as tasters. <laughs> I sure <laughs> hope so because we've tasted quite a bit Tasting of it. Yeah, <laughs> still is, yeah. uh, what was y'all's favorite, do you think? Uh, we might be unanimous on this, actually. I think mine was, was still going to be the Flaming Heart. It, it's got to be the Flaming yeah. Heart. Yeah, Flaming yeah. Heart all the way. Then especially at the end of the tasting, we're like, would you would you like a pour of any one of the ones? We, oh, yes, yes, yes. Flaming Heart, please again. Please. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. I'll double up on the Flaming Heart. No yeah. problem. No problem. Well, and, and the thing that first caught my attention about uh, the presentation that they gave is they spoke highly of how they feel strongly that you can't take a bunch of subpar products and try to make something great out of them. You start with great products and build them up to something even more unique and better. And that's kind of their whole standard on things. Just like we said with the, the 19 year kale and the flaming heart, that's not something you just dump as a filler. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's some serious yeah. whiskey to boot. Yep. That's some special stuff. And even, even on their uh, kind of budget, I, I hesitate to even call it lower end, but they have their great King street, line and we got to try both of those uh, several times uh the artist blend being more of a highland space side kind of thing and the glasgow blend having more peat and cherry to it um yeah. they, they actually like the percentage of malt whiskey because this is a blended scotch right so it has grain whiskey and it has malt whiskey in it uh blended together uh, but they're at around she said 55 to 68 percent malt even in their kind of lower end budget blends. These are like, you know, 35, 40 bucks a bottle. Um, whereas other blended scotches are much, much lower in the malt content. So you get, you get a lot more body, uh, a lot more uh, longer finish, things like that uh, by them uh, investing in having the higher malt content. She said it's actually the, the, the whiskey that they make the least amount of money on. That great King streak had a uh, 16 year in the Freud in it. Right. <laughs> right. Come on now. Yeah. 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 Well, they're blending it and they're putting it back in a cast and they're taking it out of these casts, blending it again, then marrying it back in another cast. Yeah. That's a very lengthy process. Yeah. You know, I can see how you straighten that out over time. Your, your cost is just, it's up in so much that, you know, if you want to make this still affordable, your profit's going to be so low on it, but I'm so glad that they're still willing to do that. To Absolutely. Give out a good product that people can afford on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that uh, I've, always encountered or even uh, seen in a lot of uh, newer business ventures is that you need to spend a bit of money to make a bit of money. So right. with, with them uh, having a lot of their releases low profit in order to get their name out there, which at this point, it's fairly recognizable for the, the majority of the people in the whiskey world. But for a lot of the people that are still trying to get like a foothold, you know, in in the in the door it's it's an un, it's still an unknown um i guess um avenue for them to take so you know them keeping it lower cost is is a great business model that a lot of other brands seemingly don't take absolutely and uh, i i found it uh, really interesting like not only they're a small company not only are they doing creative things they uh they mostly distribute to smaller stores, independent stores. You can find them in your total wines and specs and things like that. But uh, at least around here in Austin, if you want to find a fuller range of compass box selections, you're going to the small independent liquor stores. Uh, and they really, they really value having that as a small company themselves, having that relationship uh, with uh, small stores and independents, uh, which I think was very cool. And, you know, the creative stuff that they do. Are you familiar with Spice Tree, Vito? You've had Spice Tree? I haven't, but I've heard a lot of nice things about it. So Spice Tree originally got them in trouble 
Really? With, with the Scotch Whiskey Association, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so you gotta have to explain that to me because I didn't didn't hear anything about this. Yeah, we got a little spice tree right here. Anybody that's never seen it before, great whiskey. Um, highly recommend. But um, a barrel under the Scotch Whiskey Association rules can only have what is it? Uh, four components, right? Yes, you can have the heads, the barrel. You heads, have the, the staves, the and the hoops, the staves, and the heads. Yeah. Uh, oh, so three components, three yeah, components. Three. They added the they fourth. Added the fourth one, which was the extra staves on the inside. Right, which I think were French oak. Right. Is what he did. Uh, oh, so when, 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 when they do that, do they just add an extra stave to the inside of the of the exterior stave? Well, they made like another layer. Of it's almost like a doubling up of the barrel on the inside, if you will. Okay, that so it can it can hit both uh, surfaces essentially. Right. Okay. right. So, but that process technically against the rules. So what they decided to do in future uh, releases of Spice Tree was to toast the barrel heads, make those out of the French oak, and then let it age, I think he said, an extra six months or something Maybe like that. Extra year. Extra year, yeah. And um, they called it their, their hybrid cask. Hybrid cask, yeah, yeah that's right. That's Interesting. Right. Um, so yeah, I, Gretchen asked earlier, which compass box do I recommend? I mean, Flaming Heart, obviously, we all loved that, but uh, out of the ones you can find everywhere, Pete Monster's great. Pete Monster's great. Uh, honestly, the, the phenomenology was probably the, uh, the most eye-opening to me, and, and, and as someone who has kind of uh, self-admittedly has been snobbish about blends in the past, sure. this one really opened my eyes up to, to the fact that they had something special. They were producing a product that was not just a you know, bottom shelf filler kind of whiskey. It was something that they was really unique. And so in trying this pheno pheno uh, phenomenology over here, uh, mm -hmm. it was one of the more complex whiskeys I had had in a, in a very long time and, and was just completely blown away. And since then I've just been all in on Compass Box and it's, uh, the results are there. I mean, Absolutely. everything they're doing is is pretty special. Even even like I said, down to that forty seven dollar bottle of King Street American Dollars, it's like, you know, it's a it's a quality whiskey. Yep, um, and it looks like uh, Sniper Mac there in the chat. You know him, right? He's yeah, a Sniper Mac is uh, Mike McDonald from Canada. Cool. He says you guys are getting a lot more Compass Box at your LCBO stores these days. Yeah, they um, they only had um, the um, Great King Street. And another one of their budget blends. When I say budget blends, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we started getting uh, the Pete Monster and one other expression, but it goes back to last week's episode. Was it last week's episode or two weeks ago? Where we were talking about uh, um, the liquor laws and um, Ontario being just absolute, just not a nightmare to get any sort of. Right, to bring things in and out. Right. Um, for people that didn't watch it, go check it out. But for comparison, uh, a bottle of Ardbeg Ugadal in in Ontario, specifically Ontario, is 186 Canadian dollars, uh, which is almost equivalent to about 140 US dollars. And how much is a bottle of Ugadal in Texas, uh, Josh? Around about 80 bucks. So, so you're you're uh, look, looking at another an additional 60 dollars uh, for that bottle. Um, which is a little bit insane when you think about it, um, but you know that's just how how it is sometimes. But yeah, it's uh, we're starting to get a little bit more variety, but it's it's one of those things where it's like it's still uh, unless you make coin, it's hard to really sort of uh, come to terms with going, you know, spending that kind of money on a bottle of uh, a bottle of whiskey. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. You know, it's, it, uh, speaking of expensive bottles. Our favorite story that we heard from the Compass Box rep, uh, which Karen, Karen was her name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in case she catches this, thank you so much for everything. We had a fantastic Super time. Yeah, really good time. Uh, the best story I thought uh, was there's a whiskey that's, you can probably find it on a secondary market or something now, but it's not available in stores called Three-Year-Old Deluxe. And so we all know about age statements, right? Mm-hmm. Age statement in a Scotch whiskey has to be the youngest whiskey that's in the bottle, right? Right. So the three-year-old deluxe says three years old. It's got three-year-old whiskey in it. This was their comments on age statements and transparency and labeling, which uh, I know you know I'm a big fan of transparency and labeling. I'd like to know more, not less. Yep. Um, 
Bruglotti actually supported them in doing this. Their point was, we want to be able to tell people the age and the specifics of every component of this whiskey. So they made three-year-old deluxe. It was $300 when it came out. 90% of it was 26-year-old Klein Leash. 9.4% of it was Talisker 20-year-old. And then the final 0.6% was a three-year-old whiskey. Which <laughs> 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 so I thought was like, it's like they just bottled a whole bunch of smart ass right there. Yeah, that's that's just a big, a big F you to the, to the association. Yeah. That's why she was like, it's the world's most expensive three-year-old whiskey. Right. And she, she made the point that, uh, you know, companies have a lot to gain from not being transparent. They can have a lot more flexibility as to what goes in their blends from time to time, which, you know, I can understand, you know, you absolutely. can, uh, but, but can, can that's can not see, Compass Box's goal. Yeah, absolutely. Like she was saying too, there are a lot of big companies that would, that wouldn't benefit them. Oh they, yeah. They don't want to release that information. Absolutely. Right? So that's kind of a two-way street, you know? Absolutely. So yeah, uh, they've got a couple of uh, like new releases or they're re-releasing things that were uh, out in the past, like Juveniles is something that they've had out before. They're releasing a new batch of that. It's named after a, a wine bar in France that I think helped them craft that whiskey, right. something like that. And so uh, I would assume it's probably port or sherry finished. Um, I don't remember the details about what goes into the Juvenile. She didn't really go into uh, you know that in depth, but right. Uh, what she did describe is that there's, you know, some bottles have an indentation in the bottom. Okay. Uh, especially wine bottles. They dangled a little bell <laughs> in, in that so you can actually ring the bottle. That's absolutely amazing. I would buy just for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the, the other one they have coming out is called Stranger and Stranger. Really don't have any information about that other than it cannot be called Scotch because it has some very young components that are, you know, less than three years. So. Yeah, right. actually, I remember. I remember. I don't know if it, if we were talking about that a couple of days ago, or if I or if I read that somewhere else. But I thought that was really really cool. Mm -hmm. Well, the the stranger and stranger thing is is cool in and of itself. Due to the fact that anyone that's actually encountered Compass Box stuff is impressed by their labeling. Their, their oh yeah, branding. It's, yeah, it's it beautiful, cool, and it's it, there's an artistic aspect to it that just makes you want to pick up that bottle and bring it home with you. Well. They were explaining that Stranger is the the, um, the firm that has done their artwork in the past, and so the Stranger and Stranger is basically a tribute. That's to right. Them. Yeah. The other funny part of that is they were saying for a while because they had to have an address registered in Scotland. Stranger was where no, no, excuse me, that was their lawyer, law firm. Yeah, that's right. Their the law, law firm, firm yeah. is where they yeah. had it registered, and they the law firm had to move. Uh, because people were knocking on the door wanting distillery tours, and it was there's literally just a lawyer's office for the for Compass Box. So, <laughs> so we, we all call it Compass Box commonly, right? But you know what the actual name of Compass Box is legally? Yeah. Is the Compass Box Delicious Whiskey Company, <laughs> 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 which is pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I remember she was telling us that. Uh, so. Her off her home there in New York is uh, is kind of like the U.S. office for the Compass Box. It's where they get all their mail. Right. And somehow they they mislabeled something. So for a while when they first started doing it, she received the mail as the Compass Box Delicioso. Delicioso. <laughs> <whiskey. laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. You know what else would be delicioso if that spice tree was a little closer to me? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um. Past past game. <laughs> that's that spice tree is about um a day and a half drive away from me so oh man so yeah so you consider yourself lucky um there jared can you get can you get that glasgow blend i really liked that for 40 bucks mm -hmm. i that's what it cost here it. um the guys in the chat um adam and um mike who are in ontario can tell me can tell us in the chat how much it costs uh, you know, she uh, she has two names for the Glasgow blend. The polite one is uh, the Johnny Walker Sniper, or the Johnny Walker, <laughs> yeah, because it's kind of a Johnny Walker Black equivalent. And uh, but if she's not in mixed company, then she calls it Johnny Walker Black on crack. Yeah. <laughs> it does favor it a lot. Yeah. So Adam Adam says it's about sixty nine dollars Canadian up okay. here. So um, I guess that would mean about $45, $50 American, roughly. Okay. Yeah, so not too far off. It's usually about 35 to 40 here on the shelf, and a total line carries yeah. it for 40 
yeah, so uh, rough estimation. But yeah, I, I've been wanting to pick um, pick uh, Compass Box up, but I've uh, sort of made it a little bit of a point to uh, polish off a couple of my bottles that need to get downed before mm -hmm. I buy any more whiskey. Do we, do we know who Captain Making It Happen is? Uh, I, I feel, well, apparently they, uh, he or she is a Husky fan. I noticed that. And I completely agree with that description. Uh, damn tasty for the price, just a little thin, excellent flavor balance. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, don't expect yeah. like full bodied, full single malt uh, kind of texture to it or anything, but for a good price, it's it's solid. You know what's good? Well, you know what's uh, what's a good whiskey for the price? What's that? Oh, good old monkey uh, shoulder. I was literally about to say, when you compare it to monkey shoulder, I mean, it slaps it around, but they're about price comparable. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> literally, you're going to say that. You, know, you beat me to it. Uh, the good old monkey shoulder. Um, so, we, obviously, uh, we like to shout out other channels around here. We've mentioned Roy Acavite many times, uh, who's amazing and continues to uh, invite people to come and check out our channel as well. What a, um, what a star he is. Absolutely. What a star. Um, and then, of course, uh, this week, amazing uh, Rex and Daniel from Whiskey Vaults uh, during their uh, vacation that they had for the last week or so on Monday uh, invited people to come check us out, too. So thank you guys so much. And anybody that's come to check it out for the first time after seeing that, amazing. Um, I wasn't even really expecting that they would do that and, and just really honored that you know, guys that are as big as them gave us, uh, gave us some props. So, um, thanks to them, but Absolutely. we have one other Thank channel we, we need to shout out though. We yeah. do. And, um, this is a little bit of, a of payback and I'm not too sure if, uh, Ed is in the chat right now, but I'm sure he'll, he'll hear about this over the next uh, couple hours and then watch it on, on the replay. But, uh, do you guys like fun reviews about good whiskeys and garbage whiskeys? I do. I am a fan. Do you like watching a couple of cheese heads having a good time sharing their passion of whiskey with the world? I just they should have more cheese on there, I think. I think so too. Well, well, cheese. I think that we should all join the camel wearing, Miller drinking, country music listening guys over at Rocket Reviews. Link will be in the description below as they lay waste to whiskey after whiskey, giving their honest opinions and well informed views on whiskeys and the whiskey world. And if you're ever in Wisconsin, be sure to hit them up for Fish Fry Fridays. Oh, and by the way, Ed, you should never make an old-fashioned with a brandy ever. Look, <laughs> bud, go check them out and support the community. Rock Out Reviews on YouTube. Yeah, but seriously, old-fashioned with brandy, that's a thing, apparently. That's apparently a Wisconsin thing. Uh, I don't get it. I Neither don't get it. Why. But yeah, no. There's almost no words for that. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, um, yeah, you I can't really come back after that. It's just no, like, yeah. no, okay. um, no. But yeah, their their channels uh, very cool. They have an interesting concept. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. They have their um, their worst whiskey watch, which has been really entertaining. Um, essentially, mm -hmm. they they um, it's a gauntlet of awful whiskeys that are uh, recommended to them. And I haven't watched their latest one with. Um, Canadian Mist and Hay Club, but Canadian Mist has been laying waste to all competitors. <laughs> which is, but but has it competed with Canadian Hunter? Yet? It did. Yeah, they did. They did that, and uh, I won't spoil it for everybody. But you should definitely go check out the videos. Um, yeah. Rocket reviews again, and um, if uh, if you're catching us on replay, the description will be in the um, the link will be in the description below uh, yeah. for everyone listening live. You you know what to do. Uh, I just saw uh, Patrick is in the chat, uh, also a confirmed Wisconsinite. Is that the proper term for someone from Wisconsin? Wisconsinite. Uh, if you want to be politically correct, I feel like that's right. Yeah, he, he confirms the uh, the old fashioned with brandy is a thing. So, jeez, sh shame on you! <laughs> really, how dare you? Um, oh, um I forgot to ask. Um, What's in everyone's glasses right now? I'm sure, I assume I assume compass box, but uh, you might surprise us. Yeah, still I still have the Delilah, which uh, that's they do these collaborations with bars, which is pretty cool. Delilah, I think, is a bar in Chicago. Yeah, it's the okay. uh, punk rock bar in Chicago. This is uh, actually celebrating their 25th anniversary on it. 
Right. Yeah. 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 So this is not not the first version of Delilah. No, it's just no, the latest. The um, so this is uh, American oak and uh, heavily sherried. Uh, is really there's there's no peat uh, or, or smoke to it at all. At least that I can tell. Um, I forget exactly what goes into it. They kind of broke that down for us the other day, but uh, yeah, I believe it's uh, this has a, a main parcel of uh, is grain that's in it instead of the malt. Yeah, it's it, like 46, 48 percent grain. I believe it's uh, Kennet Heads. It's in there. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> so it's it's quite delicious. I we compared it uh, a little sip of it earlier to something like an Aberlour. Um, yeah. And we all kind of like the compass box a little better, I think. It seems like it had a little more dimension to it. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to be nice. Trying to be nice. And uh, you've got a little spice tree. Yeah, I decided uh, to uh, to give the spice tree a shot. And yeah, the... Uh, Sorry, Jared. Mo uh, can you move up to the mic just a little bit there? Yes, I can, Vito. Uh, the cask influence is, is definitely very prevalent in the uh, spice tree. It's, it's very enjoyable. Yeah, I, I find it has like a, a greater wood influence. You can really oh, yeah. tell the French oak that's in there. Yes. Uh, adds a spicy, woody character uh, to it. And we had a little bit earlier today, but um, there. And then they have the extravaganza, which is a whole whole different deal, right? Yeah. Spice tree extravaganza. Yeah, it's it's the same as a, the spice tree, from my understanding, and they do some little extra tweaking to it. Right. And I'm okay with the extra tweaking. I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, some of that goes into the flaming heart too, right? Like part part of it is spice tree and yes. spice tree exa extravaganza. Yeah. Um, that that's that's even just cool in of itself. Like using another one of our whiskeys to produce a completely different whiskey. Right, right. Yeah. Layers upon layers upon layers. layers. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good point, Gretchen. Uh, Jared, we so we all called each other ahead of time to make sure we all wore black. <laughs> uh, but Jared has a giant X on the front of his shirt. What is that? It's Balconies. Yes. Balconies' 10th anniversary, to be more specific. Right. Uh, the 10th anniversary party, which uh, took place a couple weeks ago, where uh, they released the Brujeria Bruhir and Hechiceros. Right. And uh, those were both fantastic whiskeys. The uh, but yes, they made the tenth anniversary shirt, and then immediately realized that they probably should have done a little something more from it when they uh, walked down the street and kind of got a couple of yeah, <laughs> brother. <laughs> yeah, 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 they were being mistaken for Malcolm X shirts yes. uh, in in uh, restaurants in Waco. So kind of yeah. funny. That's um, one way of uh, gaining support, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, community outreach, right? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, are we going to crack the Kilomen? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I have yet to open this one. Um, who's, who's, de who's demanding crackage? <laughs> Roy, 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 Ross Fudd. Ross Fudd. Oh, Ross. I've seen him in here before. He's been in the chat. Thanks for coming back. Absolutely. Thanks for everybody. <laughs> I, and um, I guess um, we'll talk about it a bit later, about some upcoming stuff that we have planned a yeah. little bit more in depth um, to go along with uh, the video we released a couple days ago. Yeah. Um, so shall we uh, move on to pouring the Kilhoman? And then we were going to talk a little bit about just um, our impressions of different barrel influences. And yeah. So how about um, since you have the port? Okay. So you guys get the port, um, uh, the Kilhoman port ready. And yeah. um, I'll, um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, a whiskey that I have here that uh, for me, and a couple of other people that I've talked to and shared this with have uh, com just exemplifies barrel influence um, on a, on a spirit. So what I have is the um, Italian malt whiskey Puni, their Alba expression, which was matured in three years in Marsala wine casks from Sicily in Italy, and then finished in a, for a couple of months in. Um, Isla barrels, which held um, an unspecified distillery's um, scotch uh, for, I believe it's between 10 and 28 years is what is the year range they give. Um, I could be mistaken, but that's what I remember reading. Um, so if you've never had Marsala wine, um, it is really sweet and um, very, very fresh. Um, and uh, you immediately taste um, all the Marsala wine in this. 
Uh, and um, then just a little bit of finishing in the Isla casks, you get that weird, it, it's a weird, it, it's weird because you know it's not peated, but you get a bit of peat and a bit of brininess from the barrel sure. that, that held the Isla, the, the, that held the Isla scotch. Um, and it marries super well with the Marsala influence. And it just, it's just a dance of smoky, sweet and salty and like garden vegetables and vegetation. It's, 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 it's the one whiskey where it was like when we first tried it at a, at a, uh, in a, at an, a Toronto gathering, uh, where we were all just like, holy smokes, like, like right away, Marsala and, and Isla just mm. in your face undeniable and um yeah it's just like it's just for me and a couple other people it just exemplifies it because it's, it's so prominent and there's no question of what you're tasting you uh you're really making me want to taste your puni everybody wants to have some of my puni <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a little more familiar than most uh so uh the request for a little pork action Ooh. There it goes. Um, uh, yeah, and Jeffrey Patron uh, talking about the the red spot uh, has some uh, Marsala barrel. Yeah, we're excited to. I think I think we're getting in Ontario, but uh, yeah, we'll from see. what I've heard, we'll get some of it next year uh, mm -hmm. over here. Uh, I do have on order some of it. Let me grab a glass. Um, the green spot single cask cast strength the first time they've ever released one of those uh i've got one of those on order so it should be hopefully here sometime soon nice yeah so yeah so um the i don't know how, how do you, how in depth do you want to get on the influences uh like just kind of like do you want to skim through it a little bit sure uh well or do you yeah. want to get you want you know what I I, I want to skip it. Just I want to hear your impressions on that Killerman because if it's you had it's, this right, I've had that and I don't have my notes on me, which which means that I'm being extremely professional right now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one second, I think I have it over here somewhere. I the color, the color, I got, the color I got it. I got it. So um, the this is uh the port cast matured right. Yeah, so it's entirely matured in port casks, I okay. believe. Oh, that's so and so, yeah, full maturation in ruby ports. Um, so this, and we, I talked we, again. We we talked about this a couple of episodes ago, so I'm not going to get too in depth in it. But um, we, tr I tried, um, I joined a, a tasting at our um, at our at the Toronto local Scotch Bar that was hosted by Anthony Wells, who's the uh, owner of. Killam and Distilleries, and I got an opportunity to try the podcast uh, expression, and it stole the show for me. Yeah, this is a it's one of ten thousand bottles. Yeah, uh, apparently, and uh, this was actually I picked this up last night. It was a little bit of a celebratory whiskey because we got. Uh, I, I've been calling it the Rex bump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got uh, we got the shout out from Whiskey Vault, and we went from 192 subscribers. And like last count, where are we at? Uh, 340, I think. 340, awesome. Which is awesome. Like more than we, we thought we were gonna. We were just gonna have like 10, 20 straight. Like just and just you know share a little bit of share a little bit of our time with everybody. But uh, this is a bit unprecedented for uh, for us. So you know, thanks for everybody for you know joining us. Yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, Nick Loomis asking, uh, how do I get notifications for releases like Green Spot, Cast Strength, and Red Spot? Uh, I was just through social media was aware of the Red Spot. Uh, the Green Spot, Cast Strength, a uh, certain awesome friend we have in Ireland uh, tipped us off to that coming out. So uh, it was ordered through, uh, what's, the, what's the Michelin Sons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, this is. Mm -hmm. This is something else. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this. The the color is it, it's really really unique. Where it's almost like a a, a bright cherry wood. It's yeah. got so much amber to it. I'm gonna. I have a I have a special because I know Josh doesn't remember it, and I I doubt you guys remember me saying this when um, we were talking about this a couple episodes ago. But I have a very specific tasting note that I got um, on the palate. I'm gonna wait for your initial reactions to it, and then I'll um, 
I'll chime in with it and see if uh, see if you guys find it. Interesting. So on the nose, I mean, it's it's all smoke and rich sweet fruit, but like more so than than uh, something like uh, certainly like the Flaming Heart. Uh, that's mm. that's a lot more subtle and nuanced, and this one's pretty powerful. Absolutely. Um, mm. This is what? Uh, so it's coming out at fifty percent, so hundred proof. Um, You're getting a strong, even like. Um maraschino cherry even like sure but like then also the campfire smoke absolutely in the background all right peppery which i would expect Trying to guess what your mystery specific tasting note is now. You got me all focused on that. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll it'll come. I'll 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 surprise you guys. Yeah. I don't know. Any thoughts? What you're getting on the palate? Well, the 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 cask has so much influence on it that you're you're I'm tasting a lot of that hmm. a lot of that portwood cask. Sure. Um, but past that, definitely got the spice that you're talking about. Um, there's something else going on, almost, almost like an herbal note that I can't quite place yet, but it's definitely something that's kind of lingering uh, as as the uh, as in, in the finish. Yeah, I can't quite place it. With all the obvious things, the 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 smoke, the port, are there, but there's something there's subtle a lot behind of delicious that. In there. there is a lot of delicious in there. You can just let me just let me know when you want me to just blow your minds with. Um, actually, you know what? I'll I'll give you two. I'll give you two special tasting notes that I got. Okay. Okay. Now. <laughs> no, not now. I'm gonna torture you guys a little bit. <laughs> we'll just sit in silence and stare at you and just make it real comfortable for all the people viewing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll be I'll be comfortable. I don't know about and all the people listening afterwards are gonna be comfortable, but everyone watching, I don't know if they really want that. That's what we're about here at Cast Strength is quality, engaging, professional content. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. You have any thoughts on it? What do you think? I kind of the the smoke that's in there. It, it almost kind of comes off to me as like a pecan smoke. Mm. I could see that, like you a know, little hardwood. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it kind of it's like it's kind of rolling into some kind of like a darker fruit, but not a. a a fresh dark fruit, you know, it's something that's, it, it's got a lot of layers to it. it yeah. It seems that it's, it's interesting that you say that because right when you say that, and of course the, the wonders of suggestibility, but the second you said that I started thinking about, you know, when you're out there cooking a, a nice brisket or something like that, and you're yeah. using something like an, an alder or a yeah, pecan or something like a lighter wood, that's got a lot of flavor to it. So, yeah, yeah I could see that where it's, it's not, terribly um i wouldn't call it terribly earthy or medicinal or any of those yeah. like you know it's not like a lafroig or, yeah, or an art bag type smoke it's very it's very distinct from that but no it's actually a very clean kind of smelly smoke right yeah. and kilhoman uh so they're it's they're they're advertising as a farm distillery right so they have barley fields there they do as much as they possibly can in-house uh, yeah, one one of the one of the big things that um, that Anthony Anthony Wills was saying is that he doesn't like they 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 they're about the farm aspect, but he doesn't believe in the and correct me on my pronunciation the terroir terroir yeah the the thing tastes like where it came from yeah he doesn't he 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 puts a lot more um, emphasis on the um, the maturation process. And what barrels that he that they pick to mature everything in and finish everything in, um, he's he he he's about the 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 barrel influence of what he puts the spirits in, um, is is telling to uh, the story they're they're um, they're trying to tell. All right. So what's your what's your top secret tasting note? Okay. So um, do you want? Do you, do, you, do you want the weirdest one or the the less weirdest one? 
I mean, you're gonna tell us both, so just come on with it. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, balsamic vinegar. You could see that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I could absolutely sure. see that. All right. Uh, but on the palate, not on the nose. No, no, absolutely not. This is these are these are all palate. Because uh, the nose and the basic stuff like the port, the the, the dates, raisins, and all that. Yeah, all that's, your dark fruit notes. That's all that's all the, that your port and you know the finish is is nice and lingering and sweet. Totally um, right on the front though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the balsamic vinegar, and if you've ever been to a carnival, strawberry funnel cake syrup. I remember you telling me about that. That's right. And I was like, man, what do you mean strawberry syrup? They always put uh, um, powdered sugar on. Uh, yeah, you guys, you guys don't, I don't think you guys don't have uh, like syrups and stuff on your funnel cakes down there, do you? Uh, well, apparently it's a thing that I've been missing because other people have told me, oh yeah, yeah the syrup. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's always just covered with powdered sugar. Wait a minute, syrup on a funnel cake? Now I've been in Texas my whole life. I ain't never seen no syrup on a funnel cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a big thing. Like up here we have like Nutella, caramel. Or caramel. What kind of classy ass carnivals or veto going to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These are some, these are some uh, high class uh, Ontario carnivals. Oh, powdered sugar, baby. <laughs> hey, yeah. uh, Christina made it. Hey, Christina. Um. Yeah, I could absolutely see the. Um... Like think of, just think of just think of straw like like uh, strawberry jam, mm -hmm. right? And then just kind of like just think of like a dirty carnival. Well, the, the description on the back of the bottle, it states red currant jam. Uh, oh. which is okay. the first palette note that it states. Cinnamon, layers of citrus, floral sweetness, and, and a coastal influence. So I, I can definitely see all of those. Um, and then, of course, the finish being cooked red fruits and vanilla and peat, which is very obvious. Yeah. No. And now I, I had a little drink of water and kind of like gave myself a second to, to come back to it a little more fresh. And I, I at first didn't think there was a whole lot of an earthy peat uh, character to it, but now I'm getting more of that. I think I just needed a needed a little break from everything else. I was getting that, but I didn't want to say it since you didn't, you said there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm getting that a lot more now. Didn't want to be that guy. Oh, Gretchen wants to have a funnel cake party. We can do that when you're here. I don't know how we're going to have a funnel cake party, but... But we're using powder sugar. Yeah, damn it. That's fine. Uh, listen, deep deep fried dough, I'm uh, I'm all for, so... Yeah. I'm, oh. uh, yeah. Also, um, Ed from Rocket Review just came back, and he says... So hold on, let me let me get back over here. So Steve A said that brandy old fashions is an abomination before the gods. Yeah. Ed responded back, Wisconsin spits in the face of the gods. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So Ed, uh, definitely uh, check 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 back a couple of uh, maybe like twenty minutes ago on the on the replay, and uh, you'll get, have your little surprise there. Right. Um, but yeah, so yeah, like the, the, uh, the Killaman pour, it's just like the, the barrel influence on that being complete full maturation in that Ruby port barrel mm -hmm. is, um, is so evident. Yep. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Cause if you like, if you were to go to, from like the Mac here Bay, which is their sort of base, um, expression and then hit up the, the that port cask of uh, uh, maturation one like just the the influence that the port makes on the base spirit is insane yeah absolutely and Killaman like is fairly young right because they're the they're the youngest distillery on isla so they don't most of their stuff do they have any age statements i've not um seen yes they do oh no no they, they don't what uh what they plan on doing is um a bunch of their vintage releases that they've had they're going to uh turn into age states but i if i'm remembering correctly he didn't he doesn't he doesn't put a lot of stock in age statements mm -hmm. so they may just make make it like a small little detail on the label um similar to how eagle rare now um their old label used to say really boldly like 10 year 
Right. Now it's very sort of subtly on the, um, the top cap, if I'm not mistaken, just 10 year old um, bourbon, correct? Uh, yeah, it's still 10 yeah. years old on the backside, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, really something like that, right? So I think they may, they may take a similar approach to that because uh, I guess just the, the overall like culture, I feel like they're trying to, uh, to bring into, into like Isla, like Scotch and Isla specifically, just like, you know, don't worry too much about the age statement. It's all about what taste you're getting out of it. So, right, right. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying in the chat right now. Uh, we've got uh, Jeremy, who's from Australia, and then we have Ian, who's from uh, London, I believe. They're trying to figure out what in the world a funnel cake is. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess to explain it really quickly, it's like think of like waffle batter just poured directly into hot oil where it fries and you're just like kind of like doing like a big zigzag line and making a big circle with a bunch of like spider webby sort of detail yeah and then fries and then you take <laughs> spider web of fried dough uh probably about eight thousand calories yeah it's about as american as you can get yeah. uh, amazingness yeah i mean we i think my family gets one once a year and all four of us can't finish, I think, even a half of a funnel cake. It's <laughs> so heavy. <laughs> yep, exactly. Well, I, I, I take that as a challenge. And next time I'm in Texas and Austin, I demand a Texas-sized funnel cake, and I will polish it off in front of you all. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> last time I saw one cooked, it was actually in the shape of Texas, too, which was Ooh, you know, that, something you obviously that, that You can't get more Texas than that. Yeah, yeah, that's some artistry. Risk it, funnel cakes now. Oh, and Gretchen just said we need to take. Do you guys need to take me to a rodeo? Oh my god, that's true. Then you can say it's not your first rodeo. Oh, <laughs> and you get look at the that you just yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you have a different Kilhoman over there, the Sin Egg, right? Yes, I have the Sin Egg. Um, I've been drinking the Mac Your Bay. Um, um, Brad, our um, rest rest in peace, dead Brad. No, he's not. He's not actually dead. He's just uh, a little under the weather. But um, he uh, came over to Toronto last week and brought a bunch of samples. Extremely generous uh, of him. And so I took a, a small little sample bottle here. Oh, I say small. It's probably four ounces or something. Yeah, about three and a half. Yeah, about four ounces he gave of Macur Bay and Sineg because I haven't uh, spent enough time with them as I would have liked, mm -hmm. as I've liked. So before I buy another bottle, I asked him if possible to get one of each. Um, so the Macur Bay I've been drinking throughout the stream and it's been lovely. Um, you know, nicely peated. A lot of freshness on it, and now I have the Seneg, which I am gonna, you know, test now. Real quickly uh, I, on, I, the, on the Macur Bay, uh, I always get a weirdly specific tasting note on there. I probably told you before, but uh, I don't know if you remember what, what, uh, what do you think of it? Just real quickly. Just. <sighs> so there's nothing in the glass right now, but mm -hmm. I, cause I don't want to pour another little bit just because I've had. A sure. lot of, I've had a lot of pours and I still have another pour to go, but yeah, just from the empty glass, a weird sort of Irish biscuit note. Interesting. From the, just an empty glass, just like very light. And from what I remember, like from when I was tasting it early throughout the episode, like uh, a, a healthy amount of just like um, a soft peatness. Sure. And. Uh, oh. I always get a lot of, uh, a, lot of a lot of fresh fruits on on the on the palate and whatnot. I always get. Um, uh, and here's a quick tip: if you've never done this before, it sounds it sounds weird, but do it. Grilled lemons. Grilled so you lemon. like you cut a lemon in half, grill it until it gets a little bit charred on the underside, and Here. squeeze that over like fish or vegetables or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you get like smoky, citrusy, a little bit of cooked fruit. Uh, and and now, 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 see, I don't like. I'm not a big fan of seafood. But I, mm -hmm. I'm not not that I'm not a big fan. I don't like seafood. I just I've never been drawn to it. But now that you've said that, I get, I get 
what I smell when my family makes fish and they, they, they spritz that lemon wedge over it. Right. Cooked like charred lemon on, on fried fish. Navito's one of those inland Italians. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not, a, I'm not, a, um, and you know what? It, it, I've met a lot of people, like a lot of my cousins even are, are, are like have similar pout, like just no, no fish doesn't work. Like, like if I, if, if it's given to me, like, okay, I'll have it, but I, will I enjoy it? No. Sure. So let me ask you a question. I don't know if you have the rating over there, um, but one of the things that caught my eye is that this bottle, uh, no, it is not a, it is not a cask strength bottle, but it's still at 50%. Which is right. unusual for a scotch. Like a lot of scotches are... 40 43 46 maybe exactly and that caught my eye now the the i was i have a bottle at home i was drinking the other night that's a cask strength bottle it's just an original cask strength and it's a delicious peated whiskey yeah uh but are most of Kiliman's a higher proof and that's why i was going to ask him if he knows what those what proof those are over there or yeah that, that, well the mac your base 46 46 and the Senegas mm -hmm. 46 as well Nice. Okay. So they they do, uh, you know. I guess they, they just put a little bit like I guess, I guess it's a little bit like what uh, what Compass Box is doing, but not so much with the profit, just with what they're giving in the bottle. They're putting more in the bottle to um, make an impression with people. Right. That, that without, makes sense. With, you know, not watering it down too much, and you know, taking away a lot of the flavors. There, this is optimal for what we want. We're gonna bottle it at this, and then you know, bring people in. They're a new island distillery. They're they're up against some of the biggest hitters. Um, yeah. Something that we just learned a couple of uh, about a week ago was that uh, Lafroig's the uh, highest selling distillery worldwide out of Isla. Right. Yeah. Which I would, which I didn't expect. I thought it was. I thought it would be Bemorse, truthfully. So when I heard Lafroig, it's like holy smoke. So there's a big, uh, a big market for extremely peaty whiskeys so they need to kind of get in there and the only way to really get in there is um it's a bit of experimentation and a, and a high high abv well and it just goes to show too um you know there's things out there that that are less time in the cask uh, even no age statement and it, it just goes to show that younger whiskeys can be interesting and engaging and have depth and complexity uh, it's different than a longer matured whiskey, but uh, things like like Lagavulin Eight, right? That's that's an incredibly interesting whiskey, and it's half as old as the as the flagship, right? Look, yeah. Look at anything from Octomore, where you're sitting there at five, five years, years, seven yeah. years, and ten yeah. years being like a an absolutely abnormal thing for them, but most of their stuff is five years. Exactly. And um, we're gonna do I'm gonna do a review on this bottle at some point. But I have a a, um, a travel release Kiliman uh, called Cull Point. Oh, cool! Uh, I've never seen that before. That I haven't opened yet, but I, I plan on I plan on it now. And mm -hmm. uh, even their their um, this, um, travel release is forty six percent on this bottle. Nice. Well, I have a cast strength one of theirs. It was one of those specs store select ones. Sure, that yeah. gets mm -hmm. only fifty three percent. So it's it's not far off from this mm -hmm. one here at fifty. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, just to respond to Roy, I am not sure if he's talking about the call point, but uh, it wasn't on uh, Aquavite's um, any, uh, at least not that I'm aware of any of his videos as of late. Yeah, I, I don't recall seeing that on there either. Yeah. But um, so, what's what's your thoughts on the San Egg Then I, I've had that. I one you know what? I've just, I have I I picked it up and then I put it down because we were we were, we were talking. I'll pick it back up and. Uh, so uh, the thing is, is matured um, more in cherry cask, whereas the yeah. Mecca Bay is more in bourbon cask, right? Yeah, the Oloroso, uh, Oloroso butts apparently. Yeah, they have that kind of cool uh, on the on the front of the box. There's like a almost a, a slider. Uh, what would you call it? It's indicator. It's a small percentage sherry, large percentage bourbon, or the reverse for for the San Egg. See the rock got just jumped on and thanked Vito for the uh, for the representation. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, country music. Yeah. Apparently, I went on to uh, a top ten 
Wisconsin, most offensive Wisconsin stereotypes and country music was on there. So, <laughs> so I, I, I just, I just went, I just went with it. <laughs> Vito went to a top ten list. <laughs> Actually, no, it wasn't even top ten. It was a top nine. <laughs> that should have been your first sign. And you know, I just, I just went with it. That's what you get. That's what you get for saying that the Nickelback's uh, a Canadian product. Ah, uh, yes. Stereotypes are a real time saver. Adam Brunders, um, I can never pronounce his last name right. Brudner is going to yeah. fall asleep during the stream, buddy. It's like 18 hours past your bedtime. Go to bed. <laughs> so, um, thoughts, so, yeah. Thoughts so, on San Egg? On the, on the nose, it's, it's nice. Very different from the Mac here Bay, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I always get the, on my notes that I had that I took when I was at that, that tasting. Um, what do I got? Uh, just over overripe grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit of spice, a bit of peat. Just fresh, like sort of like white tropical fruits. Should I be like um, Horst and uh, swish around in my mouth a little bit? <laughs> Only if you can pick up the swishing noise because that's not off putting at all. Oh, that's interesting. Dark chocolate, which I don't have. Oh. That's. Yeah, um, Mouth, I find to be a very helpful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Although Mr. Weddell said that you have to be careful about how quick you do it because you can actually aerate the whiskey and change it too much. Sure. Yeah. The old Kentucky chew. The Kentucky chew. Uh, how about Kilhoman uh, Lock Gorm? I, I that was sitting right next to this port cast matured. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about it. it we didn't get to taste it, but there's uh, someone in, in Ontario that has it that. Um, I hope to share a dram and, sh and you know share a little bit of whiskey with eventually. But yeah, uh, apparently that's really freaking good. <laughs> uh, oh, Patrick Cohn's in the chat. Uh, I believe he's uh, coming to Austin this weekend on Friday or Saturday. Uh, and we're going to try and meet up at Balcones if possible. But uh, or Balcones this Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really good. That's better than than I remember. Yeah, that's nice. Which is your preference between the two? Honestly, I think I like the Seneg better, and it only happened when I tasted that dark chocolate. Okay. Because um, I don't know about you guys, but I love dark chocolate and Isla whiskeys. Oh yeah, and like that pairing and salted, like my favorite, just plain salted dark chocolate with any sort of peat just steals my heart so yeah, that, that's one of my favorite combinations as well and honestly the you almost can't get a darker chocolate that will be too much for a for a big uh, isla whiskey big smoky whiskey i like the the big nasty dark chocolate the <laughs> 90 some percent cocoa just and, bitter oh you know, yeah yeah, yeah. Is that don't you have like there's a, a specific chocolate that you order isn't that there's there's the one that I like. Um, I believe it's from Vogue's is the brand. Vogue's. Well, there's so there's a few different. I because I, dark chocolate's a, a few things I like. There's the ones from Les Maisons du Chocolat, which is a mm -hmm. uh, kind of a boutique chocolate shop uh, around the world. It's a French chocolatier, but they have a big shop in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and so our yearly trip to Manhattan, Manhattan, we always make sure to pick up. Um, a case of the the dark chocolate little squares, yeah. which goes so well with just you know one square and a glass of whiskey, and it just kind of is like a perfect, well-rounded meal. Yeah. All the calories you need, perfect pairing. For a growing boy, we picked up <laughs> some uh, fresh chocolate from the Dominican when we were down there a few weeks ago. Oh, nice, yeah. So there was actually a guy that's right there with the cocoa beans, and he's mm. mashing it right yeah. in front of him. He's like, "You want some chocolate?" You know, and they had coffee and all this stuff, but their chocolate there was just. It was so rich and so just 
like super, super authentic chocolate. It like was, it was it amazing. Sounds chocolate. like almost like kind of in a pseudo raw form. Yes. Yeah. Way. Like not, and, not very processed. So the, the funny thing is, so when you purchase these, they come in, they almost look like old peanut butter jars, the plastic peanut butter mm -hmm. jars. So some friends of ours that was there with us, um, they picked up one too. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're back at the resort. And so I told them, I said, Hey, did, did you try the chocolate that you got? They were like, no, why? And I said, I tried ours. It's not chocolate. They were like, oh my God, are you serious? <laughs> it's like, yeah, they sold us dirt. Oh no. Oh, yeah. oh no. Yeah, yeah. And it she was like, like she's like, oh my God, like, what are we going to do? Who are we going to call? And I'm like, nobody. We're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you're not even a bad like, like, you you Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And so right. they're freaking out about, we bought a jar of dirt. <laughs> you know, and then they try, they're like, no, that's chocolate. Oh, no, I was just messing with yeah. you. Yeah, that's funny. There's another one I like uh, that you would have had with me before that's yeah. actually really unique. It's a it's a dark chocolate that has chili flakes and it actually has pop rocks in it. Uh, I've heard of this. Yes, it's called the firecracker bar. Oh, you can get yeah. them at Whole Foods. Yeah. Uh, what's cool about it is like, you know, you take a take a sip of like a really good peated whiskey or, or anything smoky. Um, and then you take a little piece of that chocolate and just kind of let it melt, uh, uh, melt in your mouth. And then all of a sudden, like towards the end, you start getting that kind of like that sweet and almost like rice crispy pop. Nice. It's, it's really, really enjoyable. There's there's something kind of fascinating about it. Hell yeah. Uh, I do remember having that now that you, mm -hmm. yeah, it's got the pop rocks thing in it. Yeah. And then there's another one that the, the third one all that is another favorite is it just straight up. It's bacon. It's bacon and dark chocolate. Oh yeah. There you go. Kind of can't go wrong like that from uh, it was Hammond's yeah. candy factory in Denver. They, they had potato chips and bacon in the chocolate bar. I've mm -hmm. seen those. And it was so good. <laughs> yeah. Salty, sweet, yeah. crunchy. Well, yeah. I bought a bunch of them because I, I liked it so much. And then uh, when I got in the pantry, there was only one left. And of course my kids enjoyed every single one of them. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just want to quickly point out something before we continue. Yeah. Uh, Gretchen uh, was talking to Patrick Kahn in the chat and uh, to remind everybody, because there's been a bit of not uh, a bit of confusion and, you know, unpleasantries about a certain Texas law that you can't buy whiskey on a Sunday in yeah, Texas. Exactly. So for anyone visiting Texas and uh, expecting to buy whiskeys on Sunday, uh, don't expect that. Buy your whiskeys when you can. A lot of the distilleries, yeah, a lot of the distilleries are open. You can go there and sample things and get drinks, but you cannot buy any bottles. Yeah, uh, and the liquor stores are closed as well. So, yeah, so just uh, just a, a friendly reminder to everybody if you're ever visiting Texas. That's we've heard thing. we've heard some stuff. I mean, right now uh, in the legislative session of the Texas Congress, I guess the the uh, TABC is the it's the alcohol organization governing body in, in Texas, and it's their sunset review, which means they take a look at everything TABC and say, do we still need this? Is this still relevant? Does it still make sense, et cetera? I feel like half the things in that are not relevant anymore. Yeah, I, I read an article today that they are looking at getting rid of some of the kind of prohibition era remnant laws, which is fantastic. It, it really just makes things inconvenient for people. It gets in the way of things that distilleries could be doing. Uh, nobody likes it and it doesn't really serve uh, any purpose. So, uh, you know, why not get rid of it and let, uh, let those businesses flourish more? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's, since um, there's a, enough of us here, let's do a couple of fiddly bits and um, see ourselves out. Yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about uh, barrel influences a little bit earlier. Um, maybe what what sticks out to you is as a whiskey that is exemplifies a barrel influence. Well, I I already said the Puni Alba. Yeah, you guys can find it, but um, I, I guess find that anywhere. I guess additionally, the oh, geez, what 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 would it be? Jeez, out of what I have, uh, probably the Ugud the Ugo doll. The Ugo doll, yeah, yeah, our big Ugo doll. Just that, uh, that 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 sherry flourish at the end just kind of brightens everything up. Absolutely, 
it's uh it's really really nice and it's a it's a it 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 reminds me a little bit of um not that it reminds me because I had it prior to Fire and Cane, but Fire and Cane has that what I would describe like in the middle of the finish, just like a stab of uh, sugar cane right through everything that you're tasting, and then it just finishes off really sweet from the, all that rum. Absolutely, I I get a little bit of of I I when I first had that I th- I immediately thought of Ugadol because when I taste it. It's distinctly Ardbeg, but with like a spear of just uh, weird sweetness in that in there. Right, right. Um, that just kind of marries really, really well with uh, with everything going on. But uh, yeah, it, extreme influence the Punialba, but just as mm-hmm. a, a, for an everyday, what what can you find that's easy to find? The Ardbeg Ugudal, from what I have, would be my pick. Right on. We. Um... We were talking about this uh, before we started, and I I think more than anything, the Balcones French oak, or what people call froak. Yeah. Um, it's, it is so dark and complex and tannic, and uh, it's the wood presence there is so intense. Uh, and I've had people, you know, fall in love with it. I, you know, I really enjoy it. It's not something I drink every day, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting, dense, complex whiskey. And I've had other, other people try that and just be kind of taken aback at well, how much is going on in there. It's an incredible value because you get to taste it for about three days after. You <laughs> exactly. It. Yeah. It's fantastic. Exactly. I remember when I was, um, when I was in Austin, I was staying at Engelbrick at the Wizard Academy. I got to meet uh, Zach from uh, Balcones. Oh yeah, Zach and he had well. and he had some experimental um, um, flasks with him that I think one contained um, like a precursor to the uh, what's what's one what's that one the that you just that they just released the Bruheria. the Bruheria. yeah you had like a like a precursor to that yeah. as well as a, a cast strength froak I think it was um. I think oh I, I got I got a little bit of those when we were there but uh, yeah and uh he had he had a sample of it that I that um in in the in the kitchen and I got to try it and like it it blew my socks off yeah yeah the balcones will do that sometimes yeah. uh, and the french oak barrels are super interesting they're a different shape different size right the french uh, are weird yeah <laughs> the french are weird but we love them anyway yes we do um so yeah, that's uh, that'd be my pick, I think. And unless you guys have anything else that you think is uh, exemplifies a barrel influence, I don't know. I think um, like we were talking about earlier, the Glen Drawnage eighteen has so much sherry influence in it. Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what they're doing with the barrel, or where they get the barrel from, or maybe they just left a lot of sherry in the barrel when they right. filled it up. But it has so much of that that's put into that whiskey with it. It's just, it's amazing sherry bomb. Yeah, that's definitely a thing, right? They can leave the barrel sort of wet yes. and mm-hmm. and then, or other times they can really clean it out thoroughly mm-hmm. and you get a more subtle, subtle. Well, influence. some of them they'll go through and they'll take that barrel and they'll, they'll clean it out or they'll actually scrape it out and take, you know, all the staves apart, you know, clean it, strip it and yep. then rechar it. Sure. You know, and the other ones, they just dump whatever's in it out and refill. Right. You know, right. so you, you're going to have your a lot of change based on how you treat that that barrel. Right. Yeah, the only ones that for me I would think would be, um, I brought up the Art Bag Alligator, that toasted barrel that they do. Oh, yeah. Uh, has a very, very strong influence as well. But also anyone that's ever tried any of the Octomore uh, the point four selections, which mm-hmm. are all done with the virgin oak. Right. Uh, that I've never tasted something that other than fro that just makes you understand what the barrel is capable of. Right. Uh, almost the point in the Octomore 8.4 and 7.4 that it, it almost makes it like too much tannin where yeah. you're, you're literally yeah. just, it's distracting from the rest of the uh, flavor palette that would be coming like along with it. Woods. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's all wood. Yeah. Right. Oh, wow. We oh, got that. The Scotch test dummies are here. <laughs> we just said that at the same time. <laughs> hey guys. Uh, thanks for uh, checking it out. Uh, is it, uh, who is it in there? Is it both of you or, uh, 
Uh, yeah, uh, Scott and Bart, right? Yeah, I'm not too uh, sure. Who, we we who met those guys in Austin. Uh, hey, met those guys in Austin at the uh, Crowded Barrel opening as well. So. Yeah, we saw we saw, we got to see them at the semi semi uh, secret tasting. Yes, I yeah. poured. I poured. Oh, it's Scott, cool. So I uh, I talked to you very very briefly, but I I poured and uh, let Bart know. I poured him his first taste of uh, the Karchus Lafroy Karchus quarter um quarter cask cast strength that's always a mouthful <laughs> right <laughs> lefroy karchus quarter cask cask strength <laughs> and uh yeah that, that was a lot of fun to meet you guys and uh w welcome that's awesome yeah, absolutely thanks for uh, thanks for coming to check it out i had some of that uh the other night actually after the compass box tasting that's one of the things i tried uh, how, I how how interesting is it that it's almost like uh a more balanced, well-rounded version of the, of the, of the, of the, like the forty-three percent release. Right. It's it's so strange because it's cast strength, and you you'd expect it to be just like a punch in the face, but it really isn't. No, no, it's not. Uh, and and the I, I had that one and the Madeira uh, version. Yeah, the Madeira is supposed to be really good. I haven't had that one. Fantastic. Uh, I have the Fino cask, which I really enjoy as well. Cool uh, almond notes that I get in there. But um, I don't know. People always argue about Lafroig 10, Ardbeg 10, blah, blah, blah. Like, just get the Cargis, man. That's mm. <laughs> that's where it's at with Lafroig, I got to say. Yeah, they, they, they have a lot of, uh, of awesome experiments that uh, they're doing every year. And I think those are, um, if I'm not mistaken, they're f uh, filial releases. Uh, Fischiel, the, uh, the, um, Isla festival. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's what they are, if I'm not mistaken, but, uh, yeah. They it's... have some that are that, and then they have like a wider release as well. Right. Uh, yeah. They're, it's, uh, they're, they're doing a lot of cool, interesting things, uh, yearly, but, uh, a go, a go to the go to Lefroy is the quarter cask, in my opinion. Sure. It beats sure. out, beats out all of their wide releases by a wide margin, in my opinion. And I'm, and I really like Lefroy. But uh, the core cask reigns supreme for, for me. Yeah, absolutely. That seems to be kind of the favorite, yeah, almost universally. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, no, <laughs> Booker's is cast strength and is just gorgeous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a giant Booker's fan, sometimes a little too much. That stuff will sneak up on you because yeah. it is strong and it doesn't taste like it. It uh, it does a, a mystery thing to your night, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it can. <laughs> many nights have gone in strange directions because of Booker's. So. Um, so yeah, so I guess getting a little bit back on track. Um, uh, um, recommendations. Yes. Uh, what do you have? Because I'm gonna have to think of one. I was not prepared. Yeah. We, 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 we. <laughs> We're 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 so professional over here that we didn't talk about the ending of the, this episode. That's right. Uh, what can I recommend? 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 Grab that bottle right there of Irish. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great one. So I I have been uh, venturing more into Irish whiskeys lately. Um, the Redbreast 12 cash strength really impressed me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I followed that up with a bottle of Yellow Spot, uh, followed that with the Redbreast Lestau and the uh, Jameson um, Distiller Safe, all of which I've been thoroughly enjoying. Uh, at the Compass Box tasting the other night, the uh, general manager for Seven Grand, he was like, I've got something that you got to check out. It's one that neither of us had ever heard out, heard or heard of. Uh, it is Bar on Uist. Bar on Uska. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Bar on Uska. We'll just do that, that and one. try to uh, provide. No, you got to come up up to the the other camera behind the laptop. Yeah, yeah. There we go. You see that? And it is. Uh, it had a lot of the uh, the Irish characteristics that I found in let's say the red breast 12 cash strain, but with also a kind of an earthy, uh, kind of a dank funk that I really enjoy. Uh, and it is, it is, it is really good. If you can find a bottle of whatever. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go with that. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I, I highly recommend it. It was, you know, $46 American here and uh, it's 43%. I think it's a, uh, I think it's great. Yeah, it does have a really interesting uh, musty note uh, to it that I don't often find at all in Irish whiskeys. Irish whiskeys are so uh, biscuity, fruity, uh, pretty. Um, and this has just like, it's, it's almost like uh, I like to think about whiskey sometimes in, in musical terms, where if you can break something down into having a bass, a mid-range, and a treble note. And this has kind of a low mid-range to bass note that I don't often find. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. It definitely makes it more interesting. Um, and, 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 and if you like more scotches or bourbons, I feel like it makes this more approachable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that was, that was his pick. He brought out a few cool things. The, uh, what they had a store, I guess it would be a bar pick at that point. Uh, Elijah Craig barrel proof yeah. got to try. Uh, this guy was his kind of unique recommended Irish. And then he poured us, it was a, Russell. Russell's rye cask strain single, single barrel, barrel and that I guess was like only one batch has ever been produced and it tastes like big league chew and it was amazing. <laughs> it did have a big <laughs> it 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 tastes like bubble gum. <laughs> yeah, it did have a distinct big league chew note. Yeah. So uh, I guess that would be probably our recommendation then for a uh, kind of oddball unique Irish is this guy. And get some compass box if you have it. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, we rambled on and on about compass box because they're amazing. So they they really can't. I haven't had a bad expression from them yet. No. So no. Uh, they're doing they're doing a lot of great things, and um, you know, at, at at least in America, it seems reasonably priced. So some of them can get up there. I mean, the limited editions and stuff are you know well, when compared when compared to. Yeah, well, not <laughs> not not Ontario prices for yeah. sure. But uh, yeah, no, gonna, Compass Box is great. Between the the four of us, if you were going to get your first bottle of Compass Box, not knowing enough to want to spend the hundred and whatever on the Flaming Heart or the Phenomenology or whatever, what would be your recommendation of this should be your first bottle? Uh, mine would be Peat Monster because I'm already familiar with Peat. Uh, the Peat Monster is a uh, it's a fairly decent price range. Yeah, you know. And you see it at quite a few stores, you know, so something that's pretty readily available, that's not, not a bad price. That's, that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah. I, I would say Pete monster as well, but just to change it up to something different since that was your pick. And I just saw in the chats uh, asking about Oak cross. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a really interesting whiskey and, and a great example of, of uh, cask influence, but in, in a different way than we were talking about earlier. We were talking about things that were fairly intense. I wouldn't call Oak Cross ter terribly intense, but it, it reminds me of an oaky white wine in some ways. Mm, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Oak Cross, uh, Spice Tree as well uh, is, a, is a great way to go for, for that kind of, uh, any of their core range. And yeah, yeah. I would have to, I, just again, to provide some variation, I'm going to go ahead and say, if you're not already a um, an Isla Scotch kind of person, uh, the story of the Spaniard, which is a new release from mm -hmm. them, uh, it is a an incredibly approachable whiskey. Uh, it's one of those ones you could offer to somebody that has absolutely zero experience experience in whiskey at all, and they could actually ingest it and decide like this is actually something I could pursue and enjoy further. I'm bringing a bottle to Thanksgiving and uh, gonna force my family to drink it. And if they don't like it, it'll just be more for me. Yeah, uh, Ross in there in the chat was asking uh, sweet. Uh, on we're talking about the uh, the story of the Spaniard. I would say story is, Spaniard? is yeah, sweeter. Yeah, Oak Cross is a little drier. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I would say like my first uh, compass box expression was Pete Monster. And I went into it expecting just a bomb of peat, as the name yeah, would a would, bit would, would the somewhat name. like you know suggest. But uh, I was a little bit disappointed. But then I was completely turned around when I visited Brad. Um, uh, back when did I? When was I there? Back in last March, uh -huh. and uh, he gave me a little pour of uh, hedonism. Nice, yeah. And wow, man, that that would just changed my mind completely on uh, on Compass Box, and 
Um, since then, I've tried, you know, uh, Great, Ar Great Ars Blend, Phenomenology, Two uh, Flaming Hearts. Um, I don't, I don't even know what I tried in Austin that when I came over there because I spent two days absolutely <laughs> out of my mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what a whirlwind that was. Maybe that, that's a story for another day. But yeah, uh, the, the hedonism will kind of change my mind on, uh, on what Compass Box can present to you. And uh, since then, everything I've tried and I've e even revisited um, Pete, Mon Pete Monster since. And I like it a lot more now that um, that I'm kind of I I tempered my expectations and went into it, you know, a little bit more even keeled. And sure. uh, yeah, it's just a great whiskey. Isn't uh, hedonism is a blended grain, isn't it? If I'm not mistaken, yes. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, if if I can describe it in the gr in the words of our great uh, soon to be level two sommelier co-host Brad. Mm -hmm. um, it's real good. It's real yeah. good. It's real good. Well, then to point out, yeah, I, no name, which I've seen a couple people bring up, no name is amazing for those uh, yeah, Pete that's, heads that's of us. Probably my favorite, yeah, favorite release it, it is. But but again, in general, think about the names like you've got here. Like it just makes the whole concept of Compass Box even cooler. You got Spice Tree, No Name, Pete Monster, Delilah. All right. It's just it. The upcoming stranger, stranger. So fun to consume them. Their marketing really tells a story and conveys some, you know, even just looking at the artwork and yeah. I was going to say we haven't even touched on the artwork yet. That is gorgeous. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's one thing that I really like about Compass Box is that I think they they provided layers for the different types of, of drinkers that that are consuming these. Yeah. And yeah. they have these these core ranges that are wide. You got a lot of different variances in each one of them. Something that a bunch of different people will like. You mm -hmm. know, you you have the peat, you have the sherry influence, you have you know this and this and that in different ranges. But then when you go through all those, they also have the big brother to each one of those. Exactly. When you're yeah. ready to step up, you know, a little bit more intensity, a little bit more depth, you know, more complex, you know, go from Pete Monster to No Name. Yeah. You know, you go from, you know, the hedonism to phenomenology or, or hedonism to the muse, you know. So you, you've got these levels that, that they're creating with these different blends that are just, they're phenomenal. And I guess that's where they get one of the names from, phenomenology, you know. But yep. it's it's pretty cool that they that they have is is almost like a range per se, something that you can build up to to get to that point. Yeah, that's a great point. They offer something for everybody, and and from your uh, thirty five forty dollar bottles that are great for cocktails, or just for having something that's a little less expensive, up to things that are incredibly rare and. And, uh, yeah, well, the Delilah, for instance, it says it's a uh, one of eighty-five, twenty bottles that are made. Right. And I think Phenomenology, there's seven thousand of those bottles. So these are not going to be at you know the every mom and pop liquor store. You know, they're going to be a little bit harder to find. But when you find them, grab them. They're worth them. Or don't grab them. Limp press either which way. That's that's cool too. But they're they're going to be a little bit harder. But they're worth every bit of it. They're, Absolutely. They're, uh, mm -hmm. Um, Patrick and Matt pointed out something that I forgot. They, she did tell us that the Stranger and Stranger that's coming out is uh, uh, named after the company that does a lot of their artwork, or maybe yeah, all, all of their yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, I get we didn't really talk. We didn't really go into Stranger and Stranger, but Scott Scott from uh, Scotch Test Dummies um, reminded me that, that to point out that it's a blend of scotch and non-scotch whiskeys that is true so it right. can't be labeled as a blended scotch or it's a blended whiskey yes. right it doesn't make the uh requirements to use the yeah. word scotch whiskey on it yeah yeah so that's that's re that's really interesting they, they, at the end of the day compass box is doing stuff that that uh is sort of challenging the norm and they're doing things that that draws attention through their artwork through the naming through uh you know all their marketing they're just doing everything everything right for this day and age. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, you know, dynamite, di dynamite, uh, dynamite company. Yeah, absolutely. I just have to point out real quick that I'm super, super loving the fact that Ross wanted to call it stranger danger. <laughs> <laughs> stranger danger. That would also make a great whiskey name. <laughs> you, you, you would like that, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, so uh, uh, yeah, yeah so, our, 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 I, I think basically what that boiled down to was uh, what's our compass box recommendations? All of them. All of them. All, all of them. Yeah. We'll try all of them. You can't go wrong. Yeah. There's we something for everybody. All of them, some more than others. How about that? Yeah, and they're all very different. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I um I don't know. I think we can leave it there. Yeah, I think so. Leave it uh, leave it to, leave it till next week and uh we'll figure out how to let everybody know um in a more um wide range wide range more outreaching at, uh way of letting everyone know what day we're going to be streaming next week. Yeah, yeah. Again, it goes back to it goes back to what we were ta- what I what I was mentioning in the in the previous video that I that we uh, dropped uh, yesterday morning, um, Wednesday or Thursday, one hundred percent one of those two days, but always ten p.m. Uh, EST or nine p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. So um, just keep your eyes and ears open for uh, when what day we're gonna choose, but um, We'll um we'll let you guys know probably Monday or Tuesday which day. Hopefully Monday we'll have an idea, a better idea of what day works for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, although ne- next week I didn't didn't remember. Sorry to cut you off. Next week's uh, American Thanksgiving, right? Correct. Yeah. So that 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 may pose a bit of an issue because I know Brad's traveling, but we'll try to figure we'll try to figure something out and get uh, get some content out to everybody. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I know uh, there are some people that that uh, seem to enjoy uh, coming to join us, uh, just ramble on. So. Yeah, and uh, you know we're, we've been talking about trying to do some other concepts and uh, you know stuff that isn't necessarily a live video, but maybe recording individual reviews of things and, and you know expanding what we're doing here and still maintaining this this kind of live uh, impromptu conversation. Yeah, uh, as well. But uh, we're 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 looking to expand what we're doing and and provide more content for you guys now that we've got a bunch of people interested and and again. Thanks to Akavite, to Whiskey Vault, uh, to everybody that's that's kind of shouted us out and uh, gotten gotten some attention to come to our little channel here. Uh, yeah, it's really, really it really is appreciated. Yeah. And uh, uh, it just goes to show you the the kind of uh, the community that uh, that's part that, that you know that everyone is. Well, wow, I'll I'll learn how to string a sentence together. <laughs> it it really it really goes to show that the community. The whiskey community is so embracing and uh, supportive of everybody. It's just it's it is overwhelming at times just how uh, how generous everybody is. Absolutely, and, uh, um, it's, it's a it's a it's a great uh, it's a great community to be a part of. Yep, yep. So thanks to all you guys. I think that'll probably probably do it for us. Yeah, I think so. So uh, yeah, um, slaunch everybody. Stay safe. Drink well. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.